lot of the history of the American Revolution. Okay, the American Revolution went from 1775 to uh, uh, 1781 before the treaty was was was, fin it, it was finished in 1783. And the first uh, picture of Washington is actually when he was president. So that would have been 1789. He's a lot older. Uh, that first picture. And the second picture is what he looked like when he was the commander in chief of the Continental Army. And he had no chance of winning. They thought. Nobody <laughs> thought he had a prayer. <laughs> but people sometimes, sometimes they rise to the occasion. That's what he did. With help from others. The speech. I've been retired now. I'm going to be 75, so uh, I've been retired a few years. Anyway, this is on George Washington and the American Revolution. It covers many aspects of the revolution as president. This was after uh, 1789. This is the sh this, this is when he was president. My my. Uh, book and this presentation is when he was commander in chief of the Continental Army. He looked something like that. A big man for his time. Now with all the seven footage you see around, six two and a half, six four in his uh, in his boots, uh, doesn't seem like being very big, but in the eighteenth century that was considered pretty big. Okay. George Washington was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his country, greatest American. The only other one that is considered a competitor of his, of course, is that tall man from Illinois, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Washington was a moderately successful family in Virginia. He could have stayed home with his wife and not get involved in his great revolution. But he saw that the British government was taking advantage of the American colonists and he wanted to change all of that. He also, in the early years of the revolution, couldn't stand up to the British generals who were considered among the best in the world. Men like uh, William Howe, Henry Clinton, Thomas Gage, and Lord Charles Cornwallis. They had no respect for him. They had no respect for him. And so they thought they could beat him tomorrow or the next day. And most of the time, in the early part of the war, he was running for his life. Now, I did a play with kids years ago. And the kids supposedly, you know, uh, went into the past and told Washington that was the smartest move. Escape, escape, escape until you could stand up at him and fight him to a standstill. The British didn't understand the toughness of this man the resolve that he had and the steel that he had in his veins. The inexperienced military leader would learn quickly and then fight them to a standstill. He was offered the position of, I might repeat myself because I'm an old man now, uh, he was offered the position of commander-in-chief uh, and I believe the second, the first Continental Congress, I think it was the second Continental Congress, and he took it, uh, writing his, his wife a letter, I don't know if I can do the job, but I think I have to try. The British are taking advantage of the American colonists. We go through nine chapters of the book. George Washington 
was born on February 22nd, 1732, the son of Augustine Washington and Mary Ball Washington. Uh, he was baptized in an Episcopal church, although later on in his life he became a deist. A deist does not follow religion, but believes that there is a deity, in other words, God. Uh, his, par his parents owned a, a, uh, a big farm, in, in, in Virginia and, uh, and uh, uh, they did own slaves, 50 slaves. They had 10,000 uh, uh, acres of land, but they couldn't compete enough to do tobacco or, or cotton. So his father made a living from uh, an iron business. Uh, George Washington didn't want to be a scholar. He had some education. He had become a pretty good reader, good in, in mathematics. He could speak and write well, but he didn't want to be a, a scholar. There were two colleges in his time in the colonies. William and Mary in Virginia, Harvard in Massachusetts. He uh, was a surveyor as a, a young man. That is somebody that uh, measures land. He uh, decided that he would like to be a soldier. He would like to be a soldier. Now I'm going to mention things that you've never heard of because he wasn't successful through much of his early Revolutionary War years. Now the first part of this, he, this is during the period of the French and Indian Wars. As I said, I have a lot to say and, and uh, you have to do your best to understand me. There were four French and Indian Wars. There was King William's War in the uh, 1690s. There was uh, uh, Queen Anne's War about 1713. There was King George's War in the uh, 1740s. Uh, George Washington uh, in 1753 at the age of 21 went to the Ohio. I have a picture here. This is why I was in a, you know, you know, you have some pictures that that go along with this. If you want to, if somebody wants to take them and look at them and pass them on, you can do that. But he went with uh, a very famous frontiersman by the name of Christopher Guest. The deputy, uh, the deputy governor of Virginia, Washington, of course, was from Virginia. Uh, 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 Robert Dinwiddie sent him there because to the Ohio area, the Ohio area, to check on the French because for many years during these French and Indian Wars, the French were fighting the British. He was supposed to give his determination of the situation. Okay, so in 1753, he was only 21. He had the military rank of lieutenant uh, uh, current. He had the military rank of, of lieutenant colonel. He determined that the French were not going to leave. They weren't going to leave. Okay? And so he came back to uh, Dinwiddie and he said they're not going to leave. Okay, however, Dinwiddie sent him again uh, uh, very shortly back to uh, back to Virginia and this time he had 150 men with him. He had 150 men with him and uh, as he got into as he got into the Ohio uh, he had Indian scouts uh, he had Indian scouts a uh, French 
diplomat of peace was coming close to his, his group and one of his Indian friends, known as the Half King, known as the Half King, killed, killed this uh, British emissary, okay? And uh, uh, Washington knew the French would come back with a vengeance, so he built, uh, he built uh, Fort Necessity in a hurry. The French attacked him with a thousand men. Washington had a hundred and fifty. Yet Washington had a hundred casualties, including thirty deaths. And uh, the French allowed him to leave, but they wanted him to tell the British people in Virginia that that uh, they didn't want them in, in the Ohio. Who was Crispus Attucks that you just went Who by? Who is it? Crispus Attucks. Who? Crispus he's Attucks. A point. He's, he's oh, a I'm going to get to that. Okay. He was the first you man to supposedly die. Uh, this is actually before the revolution. But historians sometimes say he's the first man to die in the revolution. I'll get to that. Anyway, it gets a little more interesting here. History, you know, a lot of people don't want to study. Okay, he came back after he after this capitulation. Washington wanted to give up his position and not and not be a soldier. He had to leave. He had to leave because the French the French pushed him out. Okay, but then he decided to go back. This time it be. The British were sending a 60-year-old uh, General Braddock, Edward Braddock, to the area, and he was going to take over Fort Duquesne. Duquesne, that was a, a French fort, okay? And they were on their way to the French fort, okay? Braddock had 2,400 soldiers. Washington had. 450 militia at the Battle of the Wilderness or, or uh, the Mangahala, Mangahila River on the 9th of July, 1755. The French attacked from all directions. Now the French fought, they learned frontier fighting. They, they were hiding behind trees and rocks and so on. Uh, Braddock's men were in the open. They were in the open. Okay? And the, they were running in all directions. Braddock was mortally wounded. He died three years, uh, three days later. And pretty much every one of the British officers died that day. Except Washington. He was shot eight times. Eight times he was shot. Somehow the bullet bullets did not penetrate his body. The story had said that the French muskets weren't accurate. They were not accurate. The Native Americans that witnessed the battle said some force. It was this preventing him from dying. Back then, it was is saving him for the next war. Back then, a musket only traveled about 150 feet. I mean, the tolerances were pretty. Pretty bad, like in, in, in like you know. The but supposedly they got a lot closer to that. Yeah. A couple of horses were shot from under him. Wow. He had powder burns all over. Daniel Boone was there, the great frontiersman. He was a kid at the time, actually. He was two years younger than Washington. He was riding, uh, driving a, a, a wagon, and he ran for his life. Anyway. Washington.
Washington tried to organize the retreat, and uh, this is what he wrote at that time of that battle. The shocking scenes which presented themselves in this night's march are not to be described. The dead, the dying, the groans, the lamentation of the cries along the road of the wounded for help was enough to pierce a heart and advent. That meant that there was death all over, but not him. After that, Washington uh, went back in, to Virginia. He uh, uh, protected the, uh, the Virginian uh, uh, frontier from the French. He uh, 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 later on, after that, he did take part. In the, in the House of Burgesses, that's, that's the lawmaking body at that time in Virginia. For 10 years he sat as a representative uh, with honor, uh, still holding the, uh, 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 the uh, title of, uh, of Colonel. About that time now, we're talking now, we're in the uh, 1770s, uh, uh, the British were taking advantage of the, of the, the colonial uh, British, and Washington, as I said, fought in the con uh, uh, took part in the con uh, Continental Congresses. The first was in June of uh, 1774, and the uh, second one was in May of 1775. By this time, the American Revolution had started. It was a Continental Congress in 1774. That, that predates the Revolution. That was before the Revolution. So they, were, they were probably planning it even before it happened. Actually, they were sending, they were sending compromises to the British government hoping right. that some compromise could come about, okay? And the British didn't even, they weren't even listening to them. They weren't even listening to them. Like they were saying, you're not treating us justly. We are Englishmen, Brit British people, just like the people that are in Britain, okay? And, and the government was not listening at all. By 1774, I mean, I guess, I guess the kind of Congress, there was definitely at that point a very definitive move for, for the United States to not be a British colony, right? To be independent. So yes, yes. Well, in you know, 1774 still isn't the United States. Yeah. It wasn't considered the United States until we, uh, in, until we, uh, uh, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, uh, 1776. Okay, so. Yes, thank you. Anyway, Washington now, Washington now uh, was in command by uh, 1775. Uh, my second chapter skips to the pre-revolutionary period to give you an idea of what of what the uh, colonists why they thought they were being taken advantage of. Uh, the British were using what they called mercantilism. The mercantilism meant that the American colonies were only only existed for the benefit of the mother country. Great Britain, okay? Great Britain, of course, included England, Scotland, and uh, Northern Ireland. Now, uh, the Stamp Act, for instance, of 1760, 
divided. We're going back a few years to get some background. Uh, they put a tax on stamps that the uh, colonists had to pay. They had no choice. And the, the stamps were on stuff that you wouldn't think stamps would be on. It wasn't just letters. They put stamps on diplomas, playing cards, dice, magazines, marriage licenses, newspapers. And this was a definite way for Great Britain to make money. Make money. They felt they had, this is after the French and Indian War, they had defended the colonists during the French and Indian War. Now they wanted to get paid back for it. Okay? They wanted to get paid back. Next are the Townsend Acts of 1767, putting a tax on all kinds of stuff, but tea was one of the main things, glass, paint, paper. Tea was very, very important because the colonists drank two, three, four cups of tea a day. They had no soda pop. <laughs> Coffee wasn't even around. <laughs> No one made. <laughs> oh, boy. The Boston Massacre was actually the colonists' fault. Okay. Okay. This was in, in the March of 1770, almost, for almost five years before the official war. They were throwing snowballs and rocks in Boston. At the, at the red coats, the British uh, soldiers wore red coats, so they called them the red coats. Eventually, the British got so annoyed, they started shooting into the crowd, hitting 11 people. Five of them died. Five of them died. The first to die was a Paul, former slave named Crispus Atta, sometimes called the first man to die in the American Revolution, although it was before the Revolution. Now, I, uh, it came to trial, and uh, John Adams, who uh, was a lawyer, in uh, Boston, uh, very famous because he wanted the war to occur. He wanted the war to occur and he did everything. Uh, no, not John Adams. John Adams, John Adams was a lawyer, Sam Adams did that. He defended, uh, John Adams defended the troops, okay? His cousin, he defended his, uh, the, uh, the, uh, people that were attacked by the British. Now at that time, the Americans were saying taxation without representation. No taxation, taxation. No but, taxation. No taxation. No taxation. No taxation without representation. And basically they said, how could you pay, how could you make us pay uh, on these laws when none of us are in Parliament making the laws. Parliament was in Britain, the House of Commons, the House of Lords. Okay, there were you know nobody in in America in the colonies sat in Parliament. So how could you do this to us? However, the British said we believe in virtual representation. There were British properties all over the world. Canada, uh, uh, Australia, a uh, 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 couple other places, and they said that laws are made in Great Britain for all our whole, the whole things. India, for all our whole things. It was becoming closer and closer to actual war. In December of 
he missed, he missed the battles of Lexington and Concord that started the war. Basically what happened was that the Americans had hidden some arms, that meant guns and so on, and ammunition in Lexington or Concord. These were outside of Boston. Lexington and Concord are two smaller uh, communities outside of Boston. Okay? And uh, they wanted to get those armaments. Okay? So they sent a force of British troops to Massachusetts, first to Boston, and then to uh, Lexington and, and Concord. Three men had gotten a hint that this was going to happen. Three men had gotten a hint that this was going to happen. And so uh, on the uh, 18th of April in 1775, they went out to warn the colonists the British were coming. The most famous of these was a silversmith, part-time patriot, Paul Revere, you've all heard of him. Also, William Dawes. William Dawes warned them that the British were coming. And also, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Samuel Prescott warned them. Now, the next day, the British came, as I said, and attacked Lexington and Concord. They never found the arms. They never found the arms. They killed several colon uh, colonial people. And then they backtracked back to Boston. Okay? A few American colonists were going to take on the greatest empire in the world. On the way back to Boston, from inside the houses, behind the windows, from behind trees and rocks, the Continentals, the American colonists of Boston and Lexington, killed 78 British Redcoats. The war officially started. Now Washington was sent. He missed. He missed the battle of. Uh, uh, he missed the battle of uh, uh, Bunker Hill. This was after the revolution started. He also missed the battle of Lexington and Concord by William Howe, who at that point was second in command, but he would be, Sir William Howe was eventually the head British general in the colonies. It, it originally was Thomas Gage. Thomas Gage. He was replaced by William Howe. Uh, Howe left, he went to, uh, uh, he went to Nova Scotia to get some extra men, to get reinforcements before he fought Washington. By this time, Washington was pretty sure that the battle was not going to happen in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, it was going to happen in Brooklyn. Okay, so he went to Brooklyn and waited. The Howe. He waited for Howe to come back. Washington managed to get 20,000 soldiers to fight with him. Mostly young boys. Mostly young boys, 15 to 18, 19 years old. Okay. Uh, who 
I never shot a rifle at a human being. Had no experience as a soldier. How had 32,000 seasoned professionals, 9,000 were the Hessians that I met, mentioned before, and the others were the British regulars. They met at the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, the Battle of Long Island, on August 27th to August 30th, 1776. They totally rooted, out fought, out, out smarted Washington, and Washington went back to his camps before exiting Brooklyn. Okay. The East River. Okay. They went in small boats. He, Washington had a, a man by the name of John Glover. He was a colonel in the Continental Army. He was an expert on boats. So Glover helped the Continental Army leaving. Now, it was a cover of fog. Fog all of a sudden came up. Okay? So they couldn't see the Continentals leaving. Okay? And they say, this is partly legend and partly fact, that Richard had, Sir William's brother, who was an admiral, was looking to get into the East River to cannonade the Continentals. And somehow the wind changed. And he couldn't get into the East River. So the Continental Army escaped. Washington again lost at White Plains. And was running for his life across New Jersey. He had given most of his soldiers uh, to other generals because he uh, didn't want to get captured and have all his people captured and end the war. Now, uh, I will continue with that thought in a while, but I did do a chapter on Continental soldiers who fought with General Washington. I want to spend a minute or two with that. And they all fought at Brooklyn Heights. Elijah Roberts uh, fought at Brooklyn Heights he was only uh, 15 when he fought at Brooklyn Heights. Benjamin Talmadge, a famous revolutionary patriot, uh, became colonel in the Continental Army. He fought with Washington. His, Benjamin Talmadge's older brother, William Talmadge, fought at Brooklyn Heights was captured and, and, and died of starvation on a British ship. And, and Francis Bateau III fought honorably at Brooklyn Heights. And he is buried in the way of the heaven cemetery in Pantheon. So anyway, Washington is heading towards the Delaware River, running for his life. Howe didn't even, didn't even follow him. He had long Cornwallis follow him. Washington took boats across the river to get into Pennsylvania. He left orders, any boats that were left, burned them. So the British can't follow us. Now at least 
Washington and the 2,400 troops he had could rest for a short time. But he realizes that Trenton, New Jersey isn't that far away. Washington had not won a battle at this point. He had been running for his life. He realized that there were Hessians at Trenton, okay? 1,400 of them. He had 21 of 400. So on Christmas Day, 1776, George Washington and his army recrossed the Delaware and attacked Trenton. A colonel by the name of Rao, Colonel Rao, the Hessian colonel who was in charge of Trenton, was one of those people in at Brooklyn Heights who had bayoneted those young officers. Washington hit Trenton from three directions. The Hessians were running in all directions. Rao would have never thought the Americans could stand up to him at all. Uh, about a thousand uh, Hessians were captured plus a few uh, 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 officers and Washington proved that the Americans also could fight. After this, Washington took Princeton, uh, Princeton, uh, New Jersey, and he had won two battles in succession. He felt a lot better about himself. He felt a lot better for him, about him. It was very uh, important. Okay, uh, the Battle of Saratoga uh, 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 in uh, uh, New York. Okay. The British had John Burgoyne as their general. He was sometimes called Gentleman Johnny. He was considered a tremendous fighter. Okay? Uh, the uh, uh, Colonials were under, uh, the Continental Army was under Horatio Gates. Him and Washington didn't like each other because Horatio Gates had been a British officer uh, before that. He had been in the British Army and he came to the colonies and he thought that he should have gotten the commander in chief's job. The second in command on the gates was Benedict Arnold, a ferocious fighter. He became an American traitor later on. Boyne had 9,000 troops, okay? In, pre, in, in early battles at Saratoga, he lost 4,000 of them. So he went down to 500, uh, to 5,000 troops, okay? Yet he still thought that he could beat Gates, and Gates was afraid of him. <laughs> He didn't want to fight him. <laughs> okay. Now, a loyalist woman by the name of Jane McRae, traveling to Albany to visit her husband, who was in the British Army, a Tory officer, was scalped and shot by Burgoyne's 
coins and Indians. The Americans didn't know that she was a Tory. They thought she was a Continental. And, and thousands of men volunteered to fight with uh, Horatio Gates and uh, Benedict Arnold. They, they didn't even realize that, that th this woman was not, was not on the American side. And so, this made Gentleman Johnny lose the battle. Gentleman Johnny, General John Goyne, lost the battle on October uh, 17th, 1777, British General John Burgoyne surrendered the what was left of his army to Horatio Gates, 5,000, 5,000 British soldiers. The French said at this time said the Americans might win the war. And so they volunteered to send a French army and a French navy to the American colonists to fight against the British. Now, as I said, the French wanted their revenge for those four French and Indian war, uh, you know, in, in those four wars in which they had lost all of them. Things looked up, up a bit when the French uh, actually said they would help the Americans and uh, I better hurry up on this because it's already 720. Okay, anyway, uh, now we're at Valley Forge, the, uh, the uh, uh, lowest point of the war. General Howe uh, had attacked Philadelphia, took over Philadelphia, and so Washington and the Continentals were camped at Valley Forge about 20 miles away. Uh, of the 10,000 soldiers that were there, 2,500 died uh, because of uh, 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 They didn't have enough food, or because they, uh, or because of the cold, and uh, they, a lot of them didn't even have shoes. Washington was there with them. With at this point, Martha was with him too at Valley Forge. The American Continental Congress could not feed or clothe the American Army at Valley Forge. General George Washington realized the young United States uh, generally had no money. So he, that they were broke. Some colonies did have to make them shoes. At this time, we had legend and history mixed. Oh, by the way, the Marquis Lafayette, Lafayette was with him at Valley Forge. If you remember your high school history, Lafayette was a 20-year-old Frenchman who was bored, and so he decided to come across the ocean to fight with Washington, okay, on Washington's side. He was only 20 years old, but he said, he would come and give some of his money to the revolution as long as he was made a general in 20 years. Washington treated him like a son and Lafayette praised Washington in every way, said if we lose this man, the revolution is over. 
He is the one that's keeping the revolution together. Washington prayed to his deity for help. He prayed every day for his deity. Hoping that he'd get help. Help, of course, was on the way. But Washington didn't realize it. These are paintings of Washington praying to his deity for help. Please send me some help. That's not in there. It's right here. He realized he had to make his soldiers better. He was fighting some of the most of the best generals in the world. We're back to Europe now. We're in Europe. We're in France. Ben Franklin, you've heard of him. Former scientist. Did uh, experiments with a kite and that electricity, uh, lightning was electricity. He was in France trying to get help for Washington's army. A former Prussian drill master, Prussia was German also. At that time, Germany was not together as one country. She had various provinces. Met by, maybe just by providence, in Paris, France, Ben Franklin, and said that he would help. <laughs> Baron von Stubinby came a drill master. A drill master that was first rate. Many years later, the Baron met Ben Franklin in Paris and said the Patriot cause was right. Franklin wrote a letter to George Washington. Saying that Brad Barron could fight. Barron von Steuben, he crossed the white ocean. He walked across the white ocean to fight. He felt that George Washington and, and the Patriot cause was right. At Valley Forge in 1778, the Baron began, began military drills. The army got bitter and then it got great with the strength of the Baron's will. Baron taught George Washington's army how to win. He did this while cursing in Prussia and giving the soldier of the soldiers a grin. An army of, of farmers, shopkeepers, and merchants who could not stand the chance in a few months were invigorated and totally enhanced. French help and von Steuben had miraculously changed the score. This underrated Continental Army could actually win this war. Shortly after at Monmouth, Continental Army pushed the British into retreat. Sir Henry Clinton and Lord Cornwallis were the generals they beat. The enemy was still far off. The British still could win. 
but hard work, chance, and possibly providence. The Lord had changed the whole darn thing. Baron von Steuben became a major general in the Continental Army. He was the help. George Washington needed and wanted. Bob Van Steuben trained the American soldier to stand up to any soldier on the planet. The Baron became an American hero, an American legend. Memorials all over this country, even today, praise his brave service. He became a citizen of the nation. He spent his last years in America. Alexander Hamilton was one of his helpers. The Baron had never had children and treated people like Alexander Hamilton like his son. The American army gave him two houses. It made a Baron von Steuben day in September. On this day, proud German Americans dance in the streets. Washington's army was heading towards Monmouth. This is where the American army pushed the British into retreat. But because one of his generals, General Charles Lee, was ahead of him, and, and, and Washington and the rest of them were tired, he sent Lee to Monmouth first. Washington was with other generals, Von Steuben, Anthony Wayne, and uh, uh, the Marquis Lafayette. Uh, the uh, Charles Lee was in retreat when Washington got there. Washington took over the battle and made the battle at least a stalemate. and push them into retreat. Now we have to tell the story. I've only mentioned one woman, Mrs. Murray. The story of Mary Bewig Hayes McCauley, a great female heroine. Her name was Mary Lee Ludwig to John Hayes and accompanied him at Valley Forge. She lived, delivered uh, pitchers of water for the, for the troops and she helped the sick at Valley Forge and at Monument. Because she carried pitchers of water she is called in history and legend Molly Pitcher. When her husband was cannonading the British, her husband felt sick. And Molly Pitcher, this is why I wanted to pass these around, took over the cannon. Here's a picture of what she looked like. You can look at it if you want. And like their brothers, their fathers, their husbands, many times were continental heroes. We go now to the Battle of Yorktown. Virginia. It took two years for the French to send an army and a navy to America to help 
the Continentals, and Big George. The French general they sent was the Comte, Comte de Rochambeau. He had a long name that came before that, the French many times. He deferred to Washington, but he and Washington communicated through interpreters. They also sent, that, sent an admiral, Admiral de Grasse. He deferred to Washington and had tremendous respect. Washington thought they should attack Clinton after the, after the Monmouth battle. Clinton went to Sandy Hook and then he went to New York and he hung out there. Okay? Or should they attack someplace else? The British Parliament was so sick of this war, they hadn't caught Washington. They, they were spending all kinds of money. If they lost one more big battle, they were going to ask for peace. <laughs> they were going to say, enough is enough. We sent enough money on this war. After discussing it with Rochambeau, Washington decided that maybe Virginia was best for a couple of reasons. Lord Charles Cornwallis was there with no British armies anywhere near him. And de Grasse, who had some, some errands in, in the West Indies, said, I could get to Virginia a lot easier then I could get to New York. And the grass promised he'd blockade the coast of Virginia. <laughs> that Cornwallis would not get any reinforcement at all. <laughs> Cornwallis didn't like Washington. He thought he was an upstart. But now he was going to be against Washington. He was going to be against Washington. But Washington was going to have help. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got 38. We got, we got plenty of time. American army, along with the French, were going to go against Cornwallis. Cornwallis expected reinforcements. Clinton in New York sent a uh, uh, British admiral with 19 ships warships to help Cornwallis. The reputation was that the British had the best, best navy in the world. But the grass had 29 warships and stopped the British uh, uh, navy from helping Cornwallis. So, General Washington had General Washington uh, and, you know, under him, ben, the General Benjamin Lincoln, General uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, and General von Steuben had 8,845 men. Uh, a 
General Thomas Nelson, who was in charge of the Millennium, Virginia militia, of course, was on the American kept his word, locked the coast. Cornwall Wallace at first thought that he'd get reinforcement. He didn't. He was so upset, he faked sickness. I'm sick. I can't myself surrender. So he sent a, a young, uh, a young uh, 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 British general named Charles O'Hara, Charles O'Hara officially, uh, I should have remembered that name, he officially surrendered, okay? He tried to surrender <laughs> to Russian Blue. <laughs> Russian Blue said, you have to surrender to George Washington <laughs> and to me. <laughs> and so, Battle of Yorktown officially uh, ended the uh, the fighting of the war. You had some minor battles after that, which were not that important. Uh, Washington went back to New York. He made sure all the British had left. There was still some at Staten Island quite a few months later. He waited till they all left. The treaty was eventually signed two years later. The Battle of uh, 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 Yorktown was in, uh, in 1781. The uh, uh, siege was started in September 28, 18, uh, 1781. And uh, no reinforcements came, and uh, the surrender was October 19, 1781. Back then, even though there was surrender, it took a long time for them to spread. Because officially, there's no modern communication. It's not like you just get on the telegraph or the telephone or, or something. So, it, you know, in those days, the official uh, end of it would always be a year later, two years mm -hmm. later, three years later. It took two years for the peace treaty to officially end the war. It ended officially uh, in 1783. King George the Third, the Third, was so upset that he resigned his kingship for a while. I don't want to be king anymore. And you will like me much more than King George Washington. But Washington had no ideas of becoming He had fought for, for seven long years to throw kings out, to make them not come to North America. And so George Washington was a remarkable man. He outlasted those military leaders who seemed better than him, no matter how hard they beat him, no matter how how long they chased them, he became a master of keeping the American Revolution going. He got help from honorable, brave people 
like that, like Lafayette and von Stuber. He got honorable help from brave women, like Mrs. Murray and Molly Pitcher. It was the, in the end, the Americans had picked the right man to lead them in their time of need. George Washington wanted liberty, but every American, after Yorktown, I told you he went to uh, uh, New York. Con River marched on Rome, made himself emperor for life, took all the power from himself. He was killed by the Roman Senate at the Knights of March. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell fought for Parliament against King Charles I. The king was executed. Cromwell was uh, suspended the monarchy, called himself the Lord Protector. He took all the power for himself. Napoleon fought battles for France during the confusion of the French Revolution. He took over, took all the power for himself. Only General George Washington, Commander-in-Chief of the American Continental Army, who was given great power, when his power was, when his, when his uh, job was done, gave all the power back to the people. That's the end. I am finished, and I thank you very much. <laughs>